Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take you on a journey to the high seas, those vast and remote open ocean areas, uh, out of sight and out of mind for many of us. Um, uh, they are host to a large proportion of the world's marine biodiversity, the marine species, habitats and ecosystems. A veritable treasure trove of um, resources and biodiversity for which we are stewards for us and future generations. And I'd like to talk this evening about why now more than ever we need a high seas conservation agreement to put in place some basic environmental safeguards around our use and access to those resources and biodiversity. First, let's look at a map to see where the high seas actually are. They're all those dark blue areas in the map, all those areas 200 nautical miles from the coastline of nation states. Uh, as Clive mentioned, this is 50% of the planet, 64% of the ocean's area, um, average depth of 4,000 metres. Now contrast those areas to those in light blue, which are waters under national jurisdiction and control. In those waters under national jurisdiction and control, we have such things as environmental impact assessment. We have such things as marine protected areas, marine spatial planning, and regulation around the way we exploit the resources of those areas. But when we get out beyond 200 nautical miles, we have very few of those types of constraints on our resource and use of the oceans. And we are rapidly moving further out into the oceans and um, engaging in activities such as exploration for deep seabed minerals, industrial scale fishing, um, increasing our transits of the ocean for the purpose of global trade and other things um, of that nature. So we are increasingly using those areas of the high seas. So we need to be more environmentally responsible about, about the way we do that. Um, recently, there was a series of articles in the New York Times, which some of you may have seen, called The Outlaw Ocean. And in that series of articles, it was pointed out the lack of ocean governance and the lack of law that is out there on the ocean, allowing the oceans to be virtual vectors for criminal activities such as illegal smuggling, piracy, um, trafficking in, in persons, and making seafarers, stowaways and others uh, very vulnerable in the process. So why should we worry so much about these remote areas when we have immediate and pressing marine conservation issues um, closer to shore? Well, quite simply, they're our lifeline. They pres provide us with 50% of our oxygen. They regulate our weather, water and climate. They are a very important carbon sink for the planet at least as important, if not more important, than terrestrial forests. Um, they absorb a huge amount of carbon dioxide emissions from the atmosphere, and um, they provide almost 20% of the world's food source um, through fish and, and other seafood. And people within our region in particular, the Asia Pacific, are tremendously dependent on that food source. So it is extremely important for us to think about how we govern these areas now and into the future. This slide I'm showing here is a miniature snapshot of the colour, life and fragility we find in the deep sea. Um, the high seas and the deep sea host millions of species, estimated 10 million species, only 1.5 million of those species have as yet been discovered by humans. Um, so it's important of us to think now and for future generations how we're going to conserve those species and to act with respect, precaution and stewardship around those um, fragile species and enormously important species for the human race. Um, so here we see, for instance, tube worms and um, bivalves 
um, at a hydrothermal vent on the deep sea floor. Um, these can have enormously uh, important genetic properties and, and we can derive genetic and biochemical materials from them. Threats to the environmental integrity of high seas resources and um, biodiversity are mounting. Um, fisheries practices is one example. Um, technological advances have made it possible for deep distant water fishing fleets to access and harvest um, slow growing species of fish such as orange ruffy or Patagonian toothfish on an industrial scale. Um, they have equipment such as multi-beam sonars, global positioning satellites, stronger cables and winches now, which enable them to locate the fish. And so overfishing is one of the key threats um, to uh, the high seas and its resources and biodiversity. Um, also things like synthetic lines and nets, virtually indestructible material, um, entrap, uh, bycatch, things such as turtles, cetaceans, um, sharks, um, non-target species. Uh, so destructive fishing, pra fishing practices of that nature, deep water bottom trawling and drift net fishing have already caused substantial damage um, to our high seas resources and biodiversity. Aside from shipping, We've also got global shipping and cargoes um, expected to triple by 2060. Um, accidental and deliberate discharges of oil and hazardous substances, ship strikes on marine life and noise, they all represent risks to um, high seas resources and biodiversity. Um, apart from these visible threats, um, fisheries and navigation we also have emerging activities such as deep sea bed mining and marine ge geoengineering, um, things such as ocean fertilisation, which all represent um, a risk to high seas resources and biodiversity. They have the potential to harm those things in the future. So it's not all doom and gloom, however. And um, I would like to say that I'm tremendously excited as an international lawyer to tell you that what some of us have been working for for over a decade um, has in fact been put in process. Um, there is a landmark decision this year in the United Nations on the 22nd of June, um, which passed a resolution, uh, UN General Assembly resolution, which decided to develop um, a international legally binding instrument under the 1982 UN Law of the Sea Convention to conserve and sustainably use um, marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Quite a mouthful. Um, but political momentum has now peaked to achieve that agreement um, and there will be a preparatory committee established uh, in 2016, it will work through 2016, 2017 to develop the elements of a new agreement to conserve and sustainably use high seas resources and biodiversity. Um, that is a tremendous achievement for those of us who has, have been working towards that objective for many years. If we look at um, the package deal which um, has emerged for that agreement, it contains a number of elements. The first element is area-based management tools, things such as marine protected areas. The objective is to have a representative network of marine protected areas on the high seas uh, designated through this agreement um, and also in the long term to have marine spatial planning to accommodate different uses on the high seas. Uh, environmental impact assessment to subject all activities which might have the potential to have significant impacts on the high seas resources and biodiversity to an environmental impact assessment process, something we take for granted in waters under national jurisdiction. A new resource, marine genetic resources, the genetic material we can derive 
from marine organisms, um, a system of governance for those, equitable distribution of the benefits, both monetary and non-monetary, from those resources among nations of the world. And finally, underpinning all those elements of the package deal, transfer of technology provisions and capacity building provisions. So here we have what I would call a seismic convergence between the law of the sea and marine environmental law. And I urge you all to find out more about this last great frontier of ocean governance and to um, lend your support to global and regional efforts to achieve it. Thank you.